Michelle Miller from CBS Saturday Morning. Welcome to The Dish. Today we're talking breakfast. It's known as the most important meal of the day, but we're going beyond traditional eggs and bacon. From tasty breakfast burritos in Alaska, yes, that's a thing, to sweet and savory pancakes in Nashville. We start with brunch in Southern California, where Jamie Wax met a chef who's growing his own produce for a place called Poppy and Seed. This is called a buzz bun. Okay. So. You can eat the whole thing, but it's gonna overpower you. Just take a little piece off of it. Chef Michael Reed's outdoor garden is full of unique ingredients. Put it on your tongue. You're gonna start getting a tingling sensation like Pop Rocks. Wow. That's, that's, it's kind of crazy. The 39-year-old chef calls this outdoor oasis his playground and delights in using its fresh results for his dishes. And it makes you salivate, it yeah. makes you hungry, it makes you curious. Like, I, what did it's, I it's just do? It's happening here. Yes. <laughs> This is one of the craziest things I've ever experienced. The bright greenhouse setting and courtyard of his poppy and seed in Anaheim, California, is surrounded by lush herbs, vegetables, and edible flowers. What would you describe your cooking as? It's basically very seasonal. I've always loved Italian. I love French. I love Asian foods. So we basically get to hide and sneak certain ingredients and to still be a California-based restaurant, but build a lot of umami flavors by using fermentation and different ingredients that you normally wouldn't find in most dishes to boost that flavor. I like to say we give you something that's familiar mm -hmm. with a twist. A twist you can taste in dishes like seared scallops with pork belly, maitake mushrooms, a celery root puree, and beluga lentils. Beluga lentils are <laughs> a fancy lentil. They have a little bit more density and texture to it. Once you put it all together, it's a perfect little bite. The textures alone are amazing, but then the flavors all start to meld in your mouth. Shrimp and lobster risotto. The colors again and the freshness of all the herbs on this are absolutely phenomenal. Finished with mascarpone and Parmesan cheeses. It's one of my favorites to make here. Also on the table, crispy mushrooms with an egg yolk topped with Parmesan cheese. All right. I'm gonna break this perfect egg yolk. Ooh, look at that. Oh, is that perfect. Hand rolled three cheese tortellini and brodo, avocado toast with pickled chilies and shallots on sourdough bread ricotta-filled squash blossoms with herbs and truffle honey. Crispy, cheesy. And sweet. Yep, that's the truffle honey on top. Raised in Oxnard, California, Reed credits his parents for his green thumb. At Garden growing up, you know, we had blackberries. My mom would make ice cream. We had peach trees, avocado trees, you know, artichokes. My mom was always growing stuff. Part of the punishment was like, if you didn't do your chores or you got in trouble, go to the garden and pick weeds, you know? And you're just like, oh, come on. Now I really appreciate what they taught me and, you know, understanding that it takes a lot to grow a lot of food. But like many chefs, cooking for a living wasn't his first dream. I was on a track and field scholarship. I was a long distance runner. So I broke my foot, had a bone chip. Coach said I would never run as fast as I would my freshman year. I was like, you're right, the Olympics are gone. Kind of shattered that dream. And so when I switched motivation from being a business accountant in school to being like, I kind of had the plan B already lined up, being like, you don't really like school, culinary school seems more your speed. I was always cooking for the track team. Reed would eventually land at the prestigious Culinary Institute of America. Went there, did the two-year program, worked at the Modern in New York, fell in love with fine dining in there. So then it snowed and I promptly moved back to California. <laughs> that's, that's all it took. <laughs> that's, it took two years of driving upstate and then back to Manhattan, and then one big storm. I was like, before it snows again, I have to leave. Grilled meatballs, no bread, scallops, mushroom, butter lettuce. After skipping a couple of steps, he became an executive chef at 26 years old. You got that butter lettuce ready? Right here on my head. By 28, he was burnt out and had to discover what not only fed his customers, but also fed his soul. I like him, I like him a lot, I like him a little bit. I love her though. <laughs> she may like me, but I love her. Okay, my friends, so, woo, you guys ordered some good things. He and his wife, Queenie, opened a popular LA brunch spot called Poppy and Rose, with him as the chef and her on the business side. I respect him when I go into the kitchen, he's chef. If I tell him there's something that we can't buy because we need to do X, Y, and Z, or we're falling short here, or we've, we've made really good revenue here, I need for you to look at that. He trusts me to say, okay, I understand, and we work together on 
building this dream that we're building together. So is this meringue? So that is dehydrated meringue. The power couple are continuing to grow their dream together with this space that blossomed during a pandemic. I want something unique on the plate. The only way to do it is to sometimes grow it yourself. And like the food they've grown themselves, Michael and Queenie Reed seem to always be reaching toward the sun. I think it's essential for restaurants and restaurant owners to stay positive and give a safe, warm, inviting place for people to come break bread, have memorable experiences, share stories, and, you know, bring people together. Up next, a trip far off the beaten path to a rugged part of Alaska where we found a restaurant serving up much more than meat and potatoes. In one of the most remote regions of the country sits a humble sounding joint called the potato. But don't let the name fool you. As Jeff Glor found out, this eatery located inside a national park is serving up some elevated cuisine. Inside on summer nights, the potato might look like any one of your favorite neighborhood restaurants. Hungry diners scooping up food at the can't miss corner hangouts. Okay. But step outside and you realize this neighborhood is unlike any other in the world. Surrounded by America's largest national park in America's largest state. The Potato is a restaurant in McCarthy, Alaska that requires the ultimate commitment to travel and adventure. I always, I just had a hankering for finding a nice wild place. I grew up in the city and I still appreciate it, but I wanted to be in the outdoors. Ian Giori is part of the small team behind The Potato, a classically trained chef who once worked at some of the finest restaurants in San Francisco. He runs the kitchen. Rebecca Bard runs the front of the house. I was uh, here for a trip. I had been doing archaeology and I had heard that they wanted somebody to come and revamp the bar. So I, I came here to work at the bar and never left and left my degree. <laughs> what Bard and Giori have created here is nothing short of remarkable. They rely on only one food delivery a week are only open four months of the year and never know what the harsh conditions that surround them might bring next. The services that people get out here are at an unexpected level compared to other parts that they've traveled in yeah. the state, I feel. Yeah. So like you, you don't expect to get this quality. I mean, no offense to McCarthy yeah, or no. anybody else, but you don't expect. Yeah, no, we hear, we hear that this. all the time. So it, you get a lot of adventurous tourists out here. So it gives you the ability to go beyond just doing burgers. When we do something like a miso salad, it's one of our best sellers. Are you catering to a fine dining crowd or are you catering to the backpacking crowd? Or is it the same thing? It's very casual. We welcome everyone. But you can get elevated cuisine here and you can get a burrito here all day. And the burrito is what has always been the it's, staple on the menu. It's what's paid the bills. It's what's paid the bills. <laughs> Not long after we arrived, Giori showed us how the famed Potato Head Burrito is assembled. How did this become the signature? Well, it was invented by the original owner of the potato, and it initially was a breakfast burrito with egg, potato chunks in it, salsa, sour cream, and jalapenos. We took it, and we decided it might be a little better if we put the fries in it. And once we tried that, it was game over. <laughs> and it's, it's what a lot of backpackers come get first when they come out of the backcountry here. The process starts with a generous handful of shredded cheese on the tortilla. Well, that moved to the oven to warm up, we moved to the eggs. You guys are really making me do the whole thing here, huh? Everything. Wow, okay. We threw carnitas and chorizo on the flat top. Now you don't want to forget about your eggs. Right, no, of course, never. So, gently. Damn it. You're gonna tilt the pan and move the eggs around. You're just trying to get it to recoat the bottom a little bit. Gentle ready? is not a word usually in my vocabulary. You ready for the fun part? Flip it. How do you do that? Yeah, well, there, that's not, there you go. Now turn the heat off and it'll finish cooking in the warm pan. That was impressive actually. Thank right? you. Then it was time for the part that puts the potato in the potato head burrito. Hand cut curly fries. Why are your fries so good? You know, I really don't know. 
<laughs> Love. While the fries cooked in peanut oil, we did one final check on our proteins. Before beginning the assembly, the eggs go first, the meat is second. So now all our fries. Oh, that smells amazing. Our fries are dripping dry. Oh. Yeah. Put a little salsa. Not, yeah. Not too much, but not too little sour cream. Okay, and next, about five to six little pickled jalapenos. Or eight to 10. Depending. Yeah. All that's missing were the curly fries. Salted, of course. No more salt. No more salt. <laughs> Which left us the task of rolling this mother of all breakfast burritos into a perfect cylinder. Ah, damn. <laughs> I almost, I think, kind of. All right, and then now fold the bottom because we want to keep it contained again. No, uh, so I'm turn, dripping. Turn, turn it 90 degrees, you're fine. It'll all end okay, up there. inside. Like this? Yep. And then oh, no. like this. Did you tear your... I tore well, it! Okay, we'll get a new foil. Yeah, give please. me a new one. The second time, mercifully, was the charm. Simple, basic, from the heart. Beautiful. Why be fancy when you can be delicious? Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> can I eat? Uh-oh. Did you nail it? You nailed it. No, I didn't make it. Amazing. To accompany the burrito, there was an eclectic mix of other potato menu selections. The miso salad with shaved Brussels sprouts, mixed greens, a soft boiled egg, and crispy fried onions. Salmon with citrus aioli, roasted beets, confit potatoes, kale, and spruce tips on top. Bangers and mash with homemade sausage, sauerkraut, stone ground mustard, and pickled red onions. Mac and cheese with Brussels sprouts. And the Spudniks Supreme, an original potato dish featuring biscuits and gravy sausage with eggs, cheese, and jalapenos. What they call both a gut bomb and the breakfast of champions. This thing is Dangerous. A, a monster. It's a monster. <laughs> yeah. A monster of goodness. Yeah. But like that will fill your yep. stomach and the person sitting next to you. Yeah. And when they're not even eating. I don't know how people finish them, but they do. Should I try? No. <laughs> well, you we'll we'll might want to take a nap. The potato is one of the most distinct dishes we've ever experienced, led by a duo that doesn't seem to belong anywhere else. And I know if I had to run a kitchen like this year round, I probably wouldn't be as happy of a person as I am. I get, I get my winters off to do other jobs or relax or travel. And I think that cult, we've both cultivated that lifestyle, being yes. in, in, a, in a town where the industry is seasonal, it's tourist. So that works for us. Jamie Wax is back with us, but this time he hits up a few major metro areas getting creative with their morning menus. From traditional bacon, eggs, and pancakes, breakfast in America, while tasty, has lacked the creative focus chefs have given to lunch and dinner. But over the past few years, that has changed in a major way giving customers a diverse array of thoughtfully crafted options. Is it fair to say that breakfast is the new dinner? Well, I would say you still got to eat dinner. But what I like about breakfast now, and by breakfast I mean sort of that weekday meal. We're not get talking brunch. But you got much more creative dishes. You have much more healthy dishes. This is not the breakfast we're used to, though. Yeah, it's a cliche, but, you know, breakfast is the most important meal of the day. Chefs are now realizing that and they want to apply their sort of attention to detail, their creativity to this meal, and I think the customers are responding. Acclaimed chefs from across the country are bringing their A-game to the morning meal. This is probably the second most ordered dish on the menu. It is and many single out one disco. chef as the pioneer of the current trend. A lot of people credit you for sort of starting this new movement. Is that fair? <sighs> I'll take it. <laughs> yeah. Squirrel is the tiny, bustling L.A. restaurant that is the baby of Chef Jessica Koslow. I remember when I was opening Squirrel, a very prominent chef here in L.A. was like, I will never do breakfast and lunch. There's no margins in it. There's no, no alcohol. Um, it's a young person's game. Good luck. When did you know you had really 
started something that was culture changing? Maybe right when I opened the door. I felt at that moment so many people responded to having a place that they could have a unique experience in dining, but during the daytime at a price that was more affordable. You got shack toast working? Okay, I need two all day. From popularizing her twist on avocado toast, to creating dishes like crispy rice salad disco, and flat tots, an elevated potato pancake, Coslo has created a breakfast menu that is anything but typical. I think what's interesting about Squirrel is that they proved that a, breakfast can be a money maker. It, you can pack the house and you can also cook really creatively. You can come up with dishes that are just as tempting and invigorating and sort of eye-opening as on a dinner menu. That is delicious. I'm oh, good. Squirrel's influence has surprised even Coslo herself. It is remarkable to see that there's an idea here that other chefs are starting to translate into their own work. That includes Michelin-starred chefs like Daniel Rose of Le Cuckoo in New York. This one is fermented for how long, uh, Neil? Uh, about three days. Three and days. famed fine dining maestro Jean-Georges von Gerichten. It wants to be healthy, yeah. colorful, all good. Jean-Georges now has breakfast service in five of his restaurants. Do you think this breakfast movement in some ways is sort of pushed forward by young chefs like Jessica Coslow? Uh, totally, totally. I mean, all those young chefs are really starting a new movement and I really admire them for, you know, pushing forward. For me, breakfast now become my favorite meal of the day. Really? Yeah, absolutely. To cook it and to eat? <laughs> to cook it, to eat it. Could you imagine yourself 46 years ago saying that? No, absolutely not. Mason Hereford surprised many by landing the number one spot on Bon Appetit's list of new American restaurants with his New Orleans sandwich shop, Turkey and the Wolf. Watch on the side. Hereford has also gotten high marks for his newer, breakfast-focused restaurant, Molly's Rise and Shine, which he runs with his fiance, Lauren Agudo. This is kind of our piece of Americana breakfast sandwich. It's got sausage, fried hash brown, American cheese, griddled onions, and then ketchup. This is sort of one of the weirder dishes. It's a deviled egg tostada with a peanut salsa and refried red bean, pickled peppers, onions, cilantro. This smells unbelievable. Yeah, that one's, I think that's one of my faves. Even so, if you're a fan of traditional morning fare who finds all these new choices a bit overwhelming, Adam Rappaport says not to worry. There's still room for everyone at the table. There's always going to be diners out there. There's always going to be the basic places that we all love to go to to get our stack of pancakes or fried eggs and bacon. Sometimes we just want a greasy plate of eggs and bacon. Yeah. Let's say you might have had a drink or two the night before. <laughs> You're just like, I just need some hash browns and bacon and eggs, and I'm good. Coming up, a story hot off the presses, or should we say fresh off the griddle. You're watching The Dish. Welcome back. And could you please pass the syrup? We're joining CBS Sunday Morning's Mo Rocca on a winding path of pancakes from Michigan to Tennessee. For Kalamazoo, Michigan's Michelle Bates Phipps, a pancake is simply a canvas. The real magic comes with what's added. Banana walnut, apple cinnamon. My next batch will be oatmeal raisin cookie flavor. Her latest creation, carrot cake pancakes. These are just baby cut carrots. Baby carrots, you can use regular carrots, but baby carrots are easier because you don't have to peel them. Okay, oh, and she, okay. Because I'm all about easy. Michelle is someone who chooses her words carefully. Did you always love carrots? That's a good question. I would have to say I have not always been a fan of carrots. And yet these carrot cake pancakes won a blue ribbon from the popular recipe website, Just a Pinch. Tell me about the moment you found out that you'd won. It was like a, oh, I won another award. That's great. You don't sound all that excited. <laughs> <laughs> Someone who is excited by Michelle's pancakes? Her husband, Willie Phipps, a blind jazz musician. Tell me about Michelle's pancakes. They're delicious. <laughs> That's Do all it. I got. <laughs> Go ahead. 
I'm making pancakes in Kalamazoo. Dun, 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 dun. You know that song, dun, 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 Kalamazoo. The first really American cookbook has um, hoe cakes in there, which are basically pancakes, but they're made with corn instead. Food historian Ken Albala managed to write a whole book about pancakes. The recipes really proliferate in the 19th century, and it becomes one of those quintessential breakfast foods and something that's really going to, you know, give you a lot of uh, energy throughout the day. And you might need that energy to wait in the line at Nashville's legendary Pancake Pantry. Come this way. Where the pancakes sell like hotcakes. Dave Baldwin is the owner of this half-century-old institution. What's the biggest mistake people make when they make pancakes? Over beating the batter. There should be lumps in it when it's still just really? a liquid batter. Is that right? Yeah. Lightly mix it. Let it sit a minute. The sheer variety of pancakes here keeps this place packed seven days a week. Southwest cornmeal pancakes. Mmm. Caribbean pancakes. Whoa. Raspberry delight. Ah. Wow. That's a big bite, son. <laughs> mm. But the bite I'd been craving was from Michelle's carrot cake pancake. Let's try some. It tastes like carrot cake. <laughs> it's great, isn't it? This calls for a toast. Who said breakfast can't be a special occasion? For more stories like these and live coverage of breaking news 24-7, stream us right here on CBS News. I'm Michelle Miller. We'll see you next time for another Helping of the Dish.